Okay, so. Welcome to um, Women in Aerospace's, uh, Women in Aerospace UK's July webinar. For those of you who don't know, Women in Aerospace, shall I say we are, that's easier, was set up in the US in 1985 and then in Europe in 2009. And there are other WIA organizations in Canada, Africa, and Mexico. Across Europe, there are local groups and cities where there is a population of space companies. And in the UK, we have a national group that meets virtually as well as in person for events. We launched, we launched our UK national group at the Reinventing Space Conference in 2016. And our main aim is to help improve the diversity of the aerospace sector in the UK through networking and support. Our three main project, project areas are unconscious bias, networking, and showcasing experts. There's lots more information you can find, and also including about uh, becoming a member. Just visit the Women in Aerospace website. We'll have this at the end of the uh, webinar as well. So www.wea-europe.org. Um, now I would like to introduce you to our guest speaker, who is Dr. Jasmine Kelland. Welcome, Jasmine. Uh, Jasmine is a lecturer in human resource management and program leader of the Masters in Human Resource Management at the University of Plymouth. Prior to joining academia, she worked as, HR ma as an HR manager in a number of organisations, such as, excuse me, I'm just going to let some people in here, that's it, because that's Airbus coming in now, um, such as the NHS, Boots, The Chemist and ITB. Jasmine's research is focused on gender role stereotyping in the workplace with a specific emphasis on parents. She has had papers published by the House of Commons Women's and Equality Select Committee and has presented her research at the Chartered Institute for Personal Development and international academic conferences. Most recently, she obtained national press coverage on early PhD findings regarding the fatherhood, fatherhood forfeits, the subject of this webinar, faced by fathers who wish to apply for part-time roles. Um, in this webinar, Jasmine will share with us her recent research insights and lead us through an interactive discussion on how we can improve the workplace experience and address gender disparity for parents. Um, we've set up the webinar so that your video is off and that you're on mute, um, and we'd be grateful if you could ensure that remains the case throughout. However, we really welcome um, your comments. Uh, we want, we'd really love to know your own experiences um, and any questions. And if you could put those in the chat box, uh, for those of you who got access to that, and we will answer them, <coughs> excuse me, at the moment. If you're on a desktop device, um, you can access chat in the meeting control, in meeting controls. Uh, on a mobile device, tap the screen and, and follow the. So without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to um, Jasmine. I'm going to uh, take myself off the screen and put myself on mute too. Jasmine, welcome. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I've never um, done a webinar before, so I hope this is going to be successful. Um, if you have any got any questions as we're going along, if I'm sort of too fast or nothing's very clear, we can't hear me, anything like that, please just email Claire, as she mentioned, and we can make sure that that's kind of sorted out. But if you can bear with me as a rookie, hopefully you'll have a session that's really useful and you'll get a lot out yeah, of it. Yeah, I'm sorry, just to interrupt, not email okay. me, but put, put, go into the chat. Go into the chat, yeah. Sorry. Okay. That's okay. Okay, so as um, Claire said, I'm a lecturer at Plymouth University, and what I'm going to be talking to you today is about my PhD findings. I've just um, submitted and passed my PhD, and this is the sort of key findings that came out of it. I've worked here at Plymouth about eight years now. Um, this topic is real, of real interest to me, as um, I'm a mum of three girls, and I've worked full-time most of the time since I've had the girls. Um, in turn, that has meant that my husband has also had to, he's been working full-time, and also, but also had to be quite involved compared to many other people that we know he's had a higher level of involvement and we've had as a family we've had quite a lot of challenges with that as we've tried to kind of combine working life and family life and so this is a topic that was very close to my heart and this is kind of where the study came from um, so if I just kind of talk you through the sort of research that I've done and my findings I think that's probably the most sensible way of doing it um, 
when I started on the PhD, the first thing that I did was to embark on a literature research, as any good student would do. And um, I think it was quite clear to establish that family life has changed. And I think that there's lots of government statistics that indicate there has been a real sort of decline of this notion of a male breadwinner and full time homemaker. And that kind of picture that's just there in the slide, that kind of archetypal 1950s household seems to have dramatically declined. Um, in turn, you can see the rate of stay-at-home dads are the highest since records began. And culturally, there seems to be quite a shift in the role of fathers with a real rise of an expectation that fathers will have some sort of involvement and have more involvement than they might have in previous generations. Recent stats also de demonstrated that more women are becoming breadwinners, with a third of women in the UK now breadwinners for their family. So really sort of indicative that there has been quite a change. So just to kind of get you thinking about that, really, I want to just pose some questions with you. And Claire will be able to set up a poll if we've managed to do it correctly. And um, I just want you to think about what do you think is the most common working arrangement for families in the UK? And hopefully you can see that poll up there now. So what is the most common working arrangement for families in the UK in 2019? Uh, just to say, for those who are uh, completing the poll now, I can see that that's uh, coming in. To get all the questions, you'll, you, may, you may need to scroll down. You may not, may not be able to see everything all at once. So the second question was, what percentage of fathers in the UK work part time? And the last question was, what percentage of fathers have taken up shared parental leave? So if you just want to have a think about that, add your answers, then we can discuss it. So we've got about half half have voted so far, Jasmine, so we'll give it a little okay. bit uh, longer. I'm hoping that you can all hear me well, because Jasmine couldn't hear me well earlier, but I haven't, there's nothing in the chat to say I can't be heard, so hopefully that's good. It might just be my PC, Claire. <laughs> That pinging is me letting people in from the waiting room, but I'll show oh, great. I'll the results are coming through thick and fast now, which is good to see. Meet myself in a minute. I'll just leave, uh, give it a couple, a uh, few more seconds. Making people think. So any more last votes would be welcome. So a few of you still to vote if you'd like to do so. Excuse me. Okay, I'm going to end the polling now, Jasmine. Okay. Let's see what the uh, results are. Uh, share results. Now, can you see that, Jasmine? I can see that, brilliant. Yes, I can, yeah. Thank you for working with, with us while we try to get used, get used to this system. Um, brilliant. So thank you for doing that. It's really quite interesting what it's come out as, actually. So you can see that overall, 50% of you thought that the most common was part arrangement was part-time working mother, full-time working father. 17% thought it was full-time working father and stay-at-home mother. And 33% thought both time, both parents working full-time. And percentage of fathers in the workplace who work part-time, um, overwhelming the majority put it at 67%. And then when you're looking at the percentage of fathers who've taken up shared parental leave, um, the majority put it at 2%, and 17% at 12 and 17% at 20. So let's, if we go back to um, my slides. I'm going to stop sharing the results now. Okay, fab. So you can see that actually, well done everybody. You've all done gold star for all of you. You've done this, your results are exactly the same as my results, which is quite reassuring, I think. And the, where I've got my data from is from the Working Families Employer Benchmark, which is the most recent data that I could find, which talking about and the most prominent working arrangement in the UK. And they have found that the part-time mother model, and much as you said, and the full-time father is still by far the prominent model adopted in the UK. Um, percentage of fathers who are working part-time is 4%, as the majority of you also said, which naturally is really quite low, as is the percentage of fathers taking up parental leave, which according to um, employers benchmark and also from national statistics from the government put it at 2%. And actually some research, more recent research has actually said it's closer to 1%. So you can see a real sort of 
dichotomy really in with what people are saying there's been a real cultural shift in the role of fathers however there doesn't seem to be a huge shift in actually the patterns of working fathers so when you think about the slide before that we talked about working um, families have changed quite a lot and the way that family life is arranged has changed a lot culturally and in practice this kind of indicates that there hasn't been such a change, that the part-time mother, full-time father model is remaining and fathers continue to work in more traditional working patterns. Um, and I think this is really important for a number of reasons, but one of the main reasons that I just wanted to highlight today, and um, this has come from the House of Commons inquiry in this area, talks about the impact that this has on the gender pay gap. And this is kind of where my heart is, to be honest with you, and this is what I think is really important. And I think I agree with the government report that's just kind of I've quoted here, that fathers who've taken the greater responsibility for childcare enables women to rejoin the workplace and ultimately reduces the gender pay gap. Pay gap. And I've just put some stats there, and I don't want to overwhelm you with stats, but I've just put some stats there about the gender pay gap, which talks about how actually up until about age 39, for full-time workers in the UK, it's very minimal. There's not a huge amount of difference between salaries for men and women. But for full-time employees at 40, it really widens. For when you're looking at full-time and part-time employees, it starts to widen after 30, which really coincides with the increase in part-time time working which around that time is predominantly due to due to parenthood and becoming a, in, invariably a mum and then working part-time so as it's that has such an impact on the gender pay gap it's really important I think to address it and to start to look at why there might be this sort of adherence to the breadwinner male breadwinner model and what we can kind of do about that in workplaces um, I continue by literature research to just kind of explore a little bit more about where these, these sort of norms have come from and how, why they're maintaining in the same way. Um, one thing that's come out a lot from the literature is this idea that good mothers put their family first and that regardless of the working hours of a mum, whether a mum works full-time, part-time or not at all, the responsibility, is, the main responsibility for children still rests on her shoulders. There's been some really interesting research from the US, which talks about the motherhood mandate <clears throat> and states that actually to be viewed as a good mother, you must be physically present and available to meet your child's needs. Um, and that ultimately women are always expected to prioritise children above work commitments to be judged as a good mother in sort of, in sort of society in 2019. Naturally, I was interested in looking at fathers. And when you're looking at fathers, um, fathers have a different expectation. Father, when you're looking at fathers in the workplace, there's more of an expectation on them to provide. And fathers are judged a lot more about provision and their ability to provide for their families rather than the expectation of putting children above work commitments. And lots of research in this area says that the expectation is that work will become work will be ahead of children in it where there's any sort of problem or any sort of challenge and that that for men that is accepted and that is expected and therefore men often in the workplace but don't face as much work family conflict because it's quite clear for them they will prioritize work whilst women are expected to prioritize children which does seem quite archaic really and certainly when I was looking at the literature I was quite surprised to find so much literature talking about those sort of quite traditional gender and gender norms remaining in organisations and so I was really interested in exploring that more and I came across some work by Badal and Moon which I found particularly and pertinent for my research and they found that one of the main reasons for organisations the more traditional organisation of working patterns was about this idea that fathers and mothers will expect penalties if, and workplace mistreatment if they go against the gendered norms, which I just found really quite intriguing. I wanted to find out a little bit more about that. So what happens in the workplace when fathers, for example, want to work part time to enable them to be around their children a little bit more and take on more of their household responsibilities. And the same, I was also interested in um, why, when mothers work full time, what happens to them and do they face any sort of levels of mistreatment? Um, just because of the sort of nature of the study, uh, whilst I compared women and men, 
most of my focus on my research has been about fathers, mainly because there's quite a lot of research around women already and the difficult time that mothers have in the workplace when they work full time. And I was keen to sort of have something new and to add to the debate really. So I focus most of my emphasis has been on actually looking at fathers. So what did I actually do? What I did first was I did an online survey of managers to actually ascertain if there was any difference so before I embarked on this research, I wanted to make sure that there was actually a difference in the way that mothers and fathers were rated when they were applying for jobs and that there was actually something to explore. I didn't want to sort of go ahead assuming that the experience that I'd had in my own personal family was going to be representative of the whole sort of UK. So I was keen to explore that right at the beginning. So through the online survey, I asked all of the managers to score the fictitious applicants. I used managers because I figured that managers would be familiar with the recruitment and selection process and would therefore not need to learn the process. They would have a bit of awareness about that already. So what I asked them to do was to rate four candidates who were equal apart from parental status and working hours. So there was a mother and a father, one worked full time, one worked part time. And I asked them to, be, to rate the, the, the fictitious candidates based on perceived competence, workplace commitment, hireability and promotability. And I use those measures because they'd been used by a number of studies before and therefore they seem to be more sort of reliable and valid and I felt more confident using them. After the online survey, after I was kind of established if there was any forfeits at all, I then undertook um, 39 semi-structured interviews with managers but also with fathers and mothers to gain an overall um, to gain overall knowledge about the workplace experiences of parents. So the results were really quite interesting and quite illuminating and hopefully you can all see that sort of chart that I've got there. What I've done is I've just summarised them all so I've added hireability and workplace competence etc together just to give an overall average just for the unconscious I didn't want to kind of show you 500 slides when you've just got an hour and so I've just kind of summarized a little bit but you can see there our part-time father is in the yellow and scored considerably lower than the other the other fictitious applicants so you can see the full-time father scored higher as did the full-time mother and as the part added the part-time mother so by far he was the most unpopular at this point of rating which made me feel confident that there was an issue around sort of fatherhood forfeits and that it was worth kind of ex exploring in more detail naturally what that quantitative data didn't tell us is it didn't tell us kind of why or the rationale so that's kind of where the interviews came in and where the more more um illuminating information comes from us from actually doing those interviews but it was great at the beginning to establish that this was a bit of a factor there was clearly something going on with fathers who wanted to be actively involved and reduce their hours as a consequence and therefore I wanted to find out a little bit more about it. So when I undertook the interviews and actually transcribed them and coded them there seem to be the main sort of key themes of what I've termed the fatherhood forfeit. And these are the things that came out the most um, strongly and also the most frequently in the interviews. And it was surprising how many of these elements came out and how strong they were. So the main three elements of the fatherhood forfeit that I'm going to talk to you about today is the first one is fathers are a secondary parent. And I've just kind of called that think child, think mum as a way of conceptualising what happens. And I'll explain a little bit more about that in a moment. It came out regularly that fathers get less support in the workplace, particularly compared to mothers. And the last thing that came out, which was something that's been found in the UK, in the US before, but not the UK, was this idea of social mistreatment, that fathers who wanted to be actively involved in caregiving faced quite a lot of social mistreatment in the workplace. And the extent to which that put them off undertaking caregiving and reducing their hours is something that I explored. And but something that I think there needs to be wider research. And we will talk about that at the end, but certainly I think it's interesting to explore how much this has actually impacted on father's decision making. Because the fathers who I met, you know, the, the parents who I met, were talking about their own experiences rather than actually sort of saying, I didn't do this because of this. So that's probably something that I'll be exploring in the future. Okay, so the first theme we had is that fathers are considered to be secondary parents, and I've called this think child, think mum, 
And the reason why is so many of the participants in the interviews talked about how they felt that children were always associated with the mum, regardless of their, the mother's working hours or the father's working hours. And that actually it was consistent that whenever anybody thought about a mum, they'd think, thought about a child, they would automatically link that child with a mum rather than a father. And one of the common ways this manifested itself was the phrase, where is mum? And that exact phrase came out, I'd say in about nine of the interviews. And if you think about, you know, just short of 40 interviews, that's quite a lot of people to say that. And how that sort of came out was that it would be lots of fathers were saying whenever they attended school events with their children or dropped their children to daycare, for example, people would be saying things like, is mum going to be here? What's your wife doing? Where's mum today? And that can be that a lot of the fathers that I talked about talk, felt that made them felt uncomfortable. It felt them made them feel that they weren't really um, welcome in that environment. It made them feel a little bit they didn't know what to say. Certainly, one chap here that I've just quoted said that he felt that his presence was met with a quirked brow whenever he turned up to school events or whenever he turned up to pick his children up from somewhere. Within Think Child, Think Mum. A common theme also came out was this idea that dads can't cope and that dad's not quite as good as mum and often I this always reminds me of Peppa Pig I don't know if many of you have got children or you're familiar with that but certainly Peppa Pig in within Peppa Pig daddy pig is really conceptualized as somebody who's not quite as good as mummy pig and tends to get things wrong and they love daddy pig but he's not quite as good and that came out quite a lot in um a lot of the interviews that dads just can't cope quite as well as mum again which can be quite a deterrent to fathers who want to be actively involved the example here i've given is from bill who said that women at the play school almost mother the children like fix emma's hair in the morning reminders of upcoming events at school don't forget ted's wellies on tuesday that sort of thing he continued to say that actually he didn't feel that anyone ever did that for the mums and it made him feel uncomfortable and again this sort of theme that made me feel not that i wasn't quite good enough the last thing within Think Child, Think Mum was this notion of unconventionality and that a lot of the fathers and the mothers talked about this quite a lot and they talked about that they felt that when they, if they wanted to reduce their hours to be more involved in childcare, they felt that people were viewed it as a little bit weird and something that wasn't considered to be quite normal, which I found quite shocking, I must say, because I do think it's such a... Um, a straightforward thing to grasp I found it really quite shocking that people would think that and that people would actually believe that's how it was conceptualized in the workplace. Um, Sarah was a full-time working mother her husband also was was full-time worker and she said that she did see sometimes men at the school gate but she felt that they were a bit strange she continued that she wouldn't really talk to them or engage with them because she didn't think they were her, her sort of people and that she just felt there was something a bit strange about them which again is really I think is quite shocking. The next theme is that fathers get less support and this came out quite strongly in all of with all of the, the participants the mums the dads and the managers but what more widely the managers I'd say lots of managers did feel that fathers would get less support than a mother in the workplace. Um, a father would be looked at differently than a mum. It's easier to perhaps think of the mum taking time off than it would, and I think they would be more supportive. They've talked about fathers being waiting to give permission, and they felt they got the, the impression that mothers, it wasn't a negotiation. They would just say, if, for example, if my child was sick, I need to go. Whereas for men, they felt that it was more of a negotiation, and they needed to make a little bit more of a story about it. And the last thing that came out was this notion of social mistreatment. And so this has come up a little bit um, in, other, in other research in the US, but it hasn't been found in the UK. So I was really quite interested to see this and um, interested to explore the nature of it, really. And one of the ways this came up was with exclusion. Um, stay at home dad, Dan, who I've quoted here, felt that he did feel quite excluded by his decision to be a stay at home dad and to be very involved with his children. He felt that he didn't get invited to things and he was very isolated as the process. He described playgroups as a viper's den for him, which meant that he just invariably didn't end up going. And he said after a few times, he really just didn't go with his four children because he just felt too uncomfortable because of the level of exclusion. 
Negative judgment was another sort of common theme with regards to social mistreatment. And excuse the kind of swearing on this one, but I did this, I just thought this was quite powerful. So a full-time working father said that he would like to work part-time, but he doesn't want to get to call from those people. And he said the word, and then I didn't really understand. And then he said Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, that's what they get called if you have Fridays off. And I just thought, again, that's really quite shocking. If that's a, the reason for not doing it. So I just thought that's why I am. Yeah, it's quite surprising that in 2019 that people would say that to you. The other element of social mistreatment that came up in the interviews was this idea that if you do want to be okay and work part time or reduce your hours to as a father, then people view that as a little bit idle that it's something associated with somebody being a little bit work shy rather than actually just wanting to be an involved parent and maybe having to because of the working hours of the partner or being single, for example. This quote was from a full-time working mum and Nicola said, I know that it works for some families, but everybody, every time I see them, I just think go to work, it wouldn't work for my house. And that was when she was talking about father's school gate in particular. Closely linked to that was mockery and some of the um, mockery that was experienced by the participants was in relation to being idle. But that wasn't the only element. There was a number of different elements of mockery. And the, you can really see how these can be a barrier to somebody who might be interested in reducing their hours or need to reduce their hours. However, they might really not want to face these fatherhood forfeits and therefore they might decide to actually maintain full time working hours and kind of conform to that notion of breadwinning as a way of just avoiding these elements of social mistreatment. This quote here was from Mark, who's director of HR with over 35 years of experience. So I think that he's in a good position to actually talk about this issue and has lots of exposure to these sort of issues. So he talked about there would be a lot of piss taking with regard to a man wanting to reduce his hours for childcare. The sort of comments would be, you're a bit of a wuss, she rules the roost, wears the trousers, that sort of thing. And there would be a lot of, you're not a real man, what's wrong with your wife? What I think is almost most telling with this quote is right the last phrase there. Um, it would be gentle, but it would definitely occur. And maybe I'm old fashioned, but I don't think that's particularly gentle. I think that's pretty strong if somebody's saying you're a wuss, someone else wears the trousers, you're not a real man. I think that's really quite powerful and you can see how that would be a barrier to somebody who might want to work and reduced hours. So kind of in summary, really, I think in lots of ways, when you look at gender equality, I think we have come a long way. I think um, men and women are on a lot more of a level playing field in so many different ways, but I do still think we've still got a very long way to go, particularly with this issue of men not being accepted at home in the same way that women are accepted in work, for example. Um, even saying that, it seems so old fashioned, but I do come from a place where this is grounded in evidence. This is from what's come out in the literature, but also what's come out in my interviews in my research so I do think we still have lots of things that we need to do about this to try and make sure that when men want to reduce their working hours they're able to in the same way that women are and therefore we want to work full time they, it's easier for them to do that and therefore they don't face the penalties of the gender pay gap that we talked about right at the start so what can we do? And this is where I'd really you know, appreciate your input on this as well. And we'll talk about this more in the Q&A. But how can we actually try to reduce the fatherhood forfeits? And um, one natural way would be to review workplace policy. As I have a HR management background, you would expect me to say that, but certainly to explore if there's any areas of potential bias at the recruitment and selection process, but also within the organisation when you're looking at appraisal and bonuses, that sort of thing. Is there anywhere that there's bias kind of seeping in and these fatherhood forfeits are occurring? You might want to consider wider training, specifically tackling the issues outlined as fatherhood forfeits. Have you seen them in your organisation? Do you think they occur? And do you want to increase your um, unconscious bias training to really specifically address fatherhood forfeits? And certainly organisations that I've spoke to, a number of people are looking at doing that and being really kind of and quite proactive about that. One thing that came out a lot was this notion of banter. And that, 
the importance of challenging that. The comments that were made by the director of HR in the last slide, which said, you know, it would be gentle, but it would definitely occur. That kind of notion that people will just have a joke about it and they're only joking and therefore it's acceptable. Challenging that workplace banter culture, I think is quite critical in this because sometimes people might not be really explicit in their mockery, for example. They might not be really explicit in their social mistreatment, but it still conveys a message that actually it isn't acceptable if a father wants to reduce their hours. And therefore, in a family, for example, if the mum and the dad are both sort of talking about who's going to reduce their hours, you can see how it might be that overall the mum just says it's just easier if I do it because I know it will be accepted and I know it will be approved of and socially it will be accepted. The last thing that I think we can do, which is broader than certainly I have the power to do, is looking at more government intervention. And I think there is scope to, to explore this more. And certainly the Fathers at Work inquiry in the House of Commons, which was undertaken last year, made a number of recommendations about this, which included potentially looking at the Equality Act and extending that to cover parental status rather than just the rights that are related to maternity and sort of wide and wider standalone rights for parents in the workplace, including fathers. So not so whilst look, there are things that exist, but being more specific and actually sort of targeting fathers with that. So that's all that I wanted to cover really, and it would be great to have your views on what I've said. Do you agree with me? Do you disagree with me? What's your experience has been? Have you got any questions on that? Well, Jasmine, thank you. This has been absolutely fascinating. What's interesting when you start looking at the <clears throat> comments coming through on the chat, it's almost like the level of shock. So it's almost what, what's happening is people are uh, responding to what you're saying. We haven't had uh, many actual specific questions coming in, but I'm sure they will. But here's kind of a flavour of what's been coming in while we wait for some specific questions. So, um, uh, for example, Carolyn uh, said that uh, she said, I've, I've recently worked with an involved father who became managing partner um, of, of a law firm and his view supported fathers. Um, he was a lone voice, but it didn't impact on his promotion. So that's a good news story. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Um, Anne um, says that um, when her partner requested shared parental leave, he was told he, he couldn't take more than two months off, otherwise it would impact. Um, sorry, I'm just admit that person in. Um, and and how we'd be seen in the workplace. Mm. Unsurprisingly, decided not to take more than two months. Um, some comments about uh, people are um, sad about this, but not necessarily surprised. Um, and then uh, Mama said, I, I've come across a situation where uh, the father sharing the parental leave missed an opportunity to work on an interesting project as it was not common to take six months parental leave uh, for a father. Um, and then is it really 2019? I'm afraid it is. And then a comment here from Carolyn, policies are in place, but they don't work. The education and banter are where we need to concentrate, including the unconscious bias, as, as Jasmine um, says, which mm -hmm. is really interesting because it, it's shadowing. A, we've done a lot in women in aerospace, um, Europe, UK, around unconscious bias. Mm. And if we're not careful, we think it's, it's it's just men that have it, um, but of course we all have it. And the point is very few of us are doing it deliberately, but look at the impact. And, and, with, and with the banter, it's, it might, like you've already said, it might seem insignificant, but it's, mm. it's cumulative, isn't it? Yeah, and certainly I think if you think about workplaces sort of 20 years ago, the things that people would say, oh, that's just banter. No one would ever talk in that way now about that and I just wonder with the fathers I think that's one of those sort of issues that I hope in 10-15 years time people say gosh do you remember the way that we used to talk about fathers in the workplace you would never talk about that now that wouldn't be allowed whereas I do you know I, I hear things all the time just generally in my workplace where you people sort of saying things and you think that's really not acceptable that's really not on you'd never say that to a mum and you certainly would never say it about any other elements of bias so yeah I think there's sort of definitely a piece around that to be done I think in workplaces. I suppose also there's a quite a good question is well okay we recognize that banter is an issue but how do you deal with it in the situation because just as it can seem insignificant uh it, it for some people it's difficult to actually challenge it because it it seems a bit petty mm. uh, but one of the things that um i found is what, what it could do because um we sort of highlight in, in our unconscious bias training is actually asking a very 
clear question and asking what has led someone to come to that conclusion. Mm. I'm very deadpan and sometimes that can actually make people think, well, actually, why am I saying that? Yeah. It doesn't always, but it can at least start sowing some seeds of, mm. you know, oh, he's, well, he's not wearing the trousers then, is he? Yes. So um, what leads you to come to that conclusion? And then, the, and then they can't find a, uh, an answer really that actually supports that. Mm. Um, just to kind of think about it and just to sort of feel confident to challenge it. And lots of organisations who feel they've kind of made success, real sort of success in this area have been, they've done it through role modelling. They've done it through, been, and you've had a sort of high profile father who says he wants to sort of take Thursday afternoons off, for example, and reduce his hours that way, really kind of promoting that and being really open about it. They think that's a really good thing and it would encourage all parents to do that. And not just parents, you know, people are entitled to have a life outside of work. And sort of as organisations generally, that's a good thing to encourage. People are entitled to do things in their free time and then likely to be more engaged and work harder when they are do and they do work for you if they're able to sort out things outside of work so I think it's good sort of culturally it's good to make that change anyway I think so can it? and it also highlights this whole culture that you can find quite often of presenteeism you know mm. you're, you're only of any value if you're actually there yes at, on the premises that's no good for it's no good for productivity it's no, no. good for innovation um but also to your point earlier on about, I think at the beginning of the, the, the webinar there, that um, if we can, if more fathers would take up parental leave or, or if it could be seen more acceptable, that then actually helps women back into work. I mean, I remember, for, I've got a very personal experience with that a, a long time ago, um, because I'm probably older than most people in this webinar. Um, <laughs> my, I was, we tried it, I, I would work, I was, trying to work full time and my husband did the uh, the caregiver role he went it was so it was awful for him I mean the, the sneering at the the, the school gates uh, all, all of the things that that you actually um, um, uh, talk through and because my children had uh, had uh, some quite um, challenging uh, special needs mm. um, in the end we did it just didn't work and I, and I, I then went part time mm. um, so it's quite a good example of, I mean, I don't regret it in, in a sense because you make choices all the time, don't you? But that's quite yeah. a good example of how it was very difficult for my husband to, to fulfill that role. Mm. And I think that's kind of certainly that was you know, our experience as a family. My eldest is 16 and certainly when she was a baby, it was very kind of, you know, it was awkward really that when he used to feel it was quite awkward when he would go to pick up some things. And it was, there was lots of sort of, there was the other element, there was kind of a fair bit of judgment me I think of working full time which is sort of a bit of a separate issue but I do think it kind of it it can explain why lots of people will revert to this sort of almost 1950s norm really of a sort of breadwinner homemaker because it just seems to be more understood by lots of people and continues to be more accepted in the workplace. Now, and any questions on what or any thoughts on what we could do about this or what's already been done in your organisations we'd really like to hear that and if you rather not put it in the chat, I can unmute you if you actually want to, you have to say in the chat that you want to be unmuted, I can do that. Really interesting to know what's actually happening or whether this is, you know, so new that people aren't necessarily aware of it. I mean, you can see it going on, but maybe it's about, as you were talking about earlier on, role models, Jasmine, and people in senior roles, and it, it, it's kind of not, not up there really. Really mm. to hear any experience that any of you have to um, just pop in the chat or, or ask a question um, on that. Yeah, Ma, uh, hi, I'm Amata. Uh, it was a great talk. Hi. I, hi. So I have uh, an experience to share. So one of my colleagues, um, she and her husband work in the same organization. And uh, the, uh, as we all know, it's quite a standard thing that, uh, oh, what are the procedures and how do you take material uh, maternity leave and so on but they wanted to go for a parental share and when they tried to figure out how to do that and how many days each one would get or how many months each one would get mm. it took literally four months for an HR to figure out uh, how long it it will take and how to sort it out with their annual leaves and how um, uh, how many days for metal, uh, for a mom and how many days for a dad so I think the the suggestion there is uh, 
it should become more common and then uh, people should have this already set. I mean, they should already expect this. I think what happened in this case was they were, they were not expecting uh, this would happen and they did not have any set rules or norms yeah. on how to do yeah. this. Uh, so probably that would help more people or encourage more mm. people to do that. Definitely. And I think that's really quite common. Lots of um, people in my interviews, they talked about they, that they were mentioned it to HR and they didn't necessarily really understand how it would work. And yeah. they were, sort of, were sort of saying that actually they were supportive, but they, were, they just didn't have the answers and they didn't really know how it would work at that point. So yeah, they were almost at the verge of uh, saying, OK, only mum will take and dad will leave it because they were not able to sort it out so quickly and yes. it was only a week or two before she went on maternity leave they sorted things out but it was mm. too late uh, you can see how that would be a barrier can't yeah, you really? yeah mm. that's really that's really interesting and i'm glad you brought that slide can i ask you a question mum so, so out of interest um i don't know if it's too new to to, to work out but has it worked has it been a successful um share if you like Yes, yes. Uh, in that instant, I think they worked out in the end and it's been successful now. Uh, uh, but another instant that I shared previously, I think well, one of my other colleagues lost an opportunity to work in an interesting project because they did not see that coming. Uh, I think if it was a uh, if it was for a mum, they would have considered it and they would have expected it and they would have worked around that situation. But because it was a dad and they did not expect it, they mm. just did not give him that project, even though it started and it was paused for another six months and he came back in that meantime and they could have still given them that opportunity. But uh, it was taken away because uh, he took the parental share. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, and that, I think it's really important that, the, that we that we get to the point where it's more visible that it act, that actually does work, and it's good for fathers, it's good for mothers, it's good for the company, it's good for the country. Yes, exactly. It's, it's a bit of a win-win. <laughs> go on, couldn't you? Yeah. Um, any more comments? Any more thoughts before we um, draw this? Um, to a close this uh, I'm not, not sure if I actually did say at the beginning of this webinar but we are recording and so it will be available um, for you to um, listen in again um, and we have here um, Jasmine's uh, details but I was just going to I thought it might be worth just kind of going back and, and, and summarizing some of the key points as, as far as I've picked up anyway um, so you know we, we looked at Clearly, family life has changed. That's, that's, that's no surprise to anybody. <laughs> the question is, you know, have our organisations kept up? It looks like not. Uh, some of them are trying hard, but many of them aren't aware. Um, I really, I think it's a very interesting point about the low take-up of uh, paternal leave. But then when you start looking at your research um, that you shared with us, Jasmine, in terms of how, how fathers are viewed, especially... Mm -hmm. Uh, as, as incompetent if they're part-time fathers. I mean, mm. Look at all that unconscious bias, it's huge, isn't it? Um, that, then, that then perhaps not. And then the, what's really interesting was those three themes really, wasn't it? All, all around, um, think child, think mum, that's right, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> yes, I hope. Um, Peppa Pig, I'm gonna have to go, Peppa Pig was before my time, I'm gonna have to go back and <laughs> that's interesting. I might be on my own with that analogy, but. <laughs> And this whole uh, <clears throat> social mistreatment piece, which is, it's appalling. And, and the, the sad thing is, it's probably not meant, I'm sure sometimes it is, but it, people just don't think about it. Um, and then we looked at some of the things that, you know, what can we do about this? So uh, we haven't um, waved a magic wand and solved the whole problem today, but um, I just wanted to thank you, Jasmine, for sharing the results. Lots of... Um, comments here about how how valuable people have found it and how fascinating so i'm sure i really appreciate that i've got my email there and naturally on twitter and linkedin so it'd be great to connect with you and then if there's any comments if you think actually you know you later on you think i've really got a good example of, the, of these then please make contact me i'd love to hear it and um, or if you later on if you get home and you think actually i'm not sure i agree with that i've had a different experience again it's just good to have the debate so don't hesitate to contact me email or twitter or linkedin it'd be great to hear from any of you about that perfect thank you so I'd just yeah. like to thank you for that next slide just just to um 
go back to uh, just to let you know what else is going on, what's coming soon, if you like, in terms of um, uh, Women in Aerospace Europe UK. So um, there's more information as you see in the bottom of the screen there. At, um, if you go to the uh, Women in Aerospace, so we are Europe dot org for such events for those of you who can't see the screen um, on some of these events but basically what we've got coming up 17th of July at 3 30 uh, at the Cambridge Institute of Astronomy there's a film showing um, Madame Mars I'll just get my notes here I can find them okay um, um, and this is about Madame Mars women and the quest for worlds beyond uh, and at that film showing, you can meet the producer, come writer, come director, Jan Millsaps, who will follow the film uh, with a reading from her novel and a Q&A session. Um, on the 22nd of July, um, Divide and Conquer, discover how job sharing works in government with Alice Bunn and Rebecca Evenden. And this is going to be held at Inmarsat in London, um, 3.15. Uh, that's that's an Eventbrite uh, registration. Again, all the registration de details are on the website here. So, uh, and at this particular event, uh, we're really hoping if you can if you can join us and the Inmarsat Women's Network for a networking and presentation session. So, it's, these are some of the themes: job sharing. What is it? How does it work? Uh, what are the motivations behind it? What is needed from both people? What are the pros and cons? What are the rights and duties? So Alice Bunn and Rebecca Evenden uh, shared the role of international director at the UK Space Agency, um, and they're going to discuss their experience in an open dialogue, followed by a Q&A uh, session. Um, so, and just also um, save the date for the UK Space Conference, um, 29 conference, that's between the 24th and 26th of September at the ICC um, in Wales. So, I think all that remains for me to um, to say, unless uh, Liz, I know who was uh, listening, uh, has got anything else to add or to um, wants me to say in, in the chat. I think that's pretty much it. So we come in ahead of time, but um, I don't suppose there's anyone here who hasn't got enough to do. So you've got ten minutes. <laughs> 10 minutes that you didn't think you'd necessarily have. So there you go. <laughs> a, a, a gift from us. So. <laughs> So thank, thank you, Jasmine. Thank you. Everyone. Not at all. No, thank you all for your attention. But yeah, keep in touch. I'd love to hear your stories. And all your questions. Okay, that's it. I'm going to end the webinar now. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye. Bye.